Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and of course this is Shackleton. I'm inhaling his uh, cat fur. And uh, I'm going to continue off on the previous video where I'm talking about how the sea ice in the Arctic is expected to respond after we have the first blue ocean event. What will happen? So, so there'll be no ice you know, in September, maybe for the full month or part of the month in a year very soon. That'll be the first blue ocean event. And then what happens in subsequent years? So probably within a few years, uh, be, there's the duration of the open water extends to August, September, October. And then within a few more years, July, August, September, October, no and November. And I've, um, I've said in the past, and I still think it's a high likelihood that there's no, there'll be no sea ice in the Arctic within about a decade of the first blue ocean event. But uh, there's actually information that has come out in some recent papers, um, and uh, they talk about maybe only about half of the year being, being uh, open water and sea ice staying around in the winter um, for much, much longer than, than the, a decade after the flu first blue ocean event. So, so let me just continue off uh, where I was discussing uh, the ice in the previous uh, video. So just to recall, if you Google Arctic sea ice graph, this is the September um, ice volume, and you can see the extrapolations depend on the curve um, to, to, to no sea ice. This is, the, this is volume. And this is September, and if that's September, that's the green curve here. And if you look at the other months, um, this is uh, August. And this is uh, October, so those months are pulled down. You know, they're very close to the curve, the September curve. And then a bit more time would go by before these ones are pulled to zero and so on. Okay, so let's have a look at what the paper. Um, okay, so, well, first of all, uh, this is the paper uh, here. It's called, you can Google this and you can have a look at it yourself. It's open source, changing state of Arctic sea ice across all seasons by Strobe and Knott. Okay, so here's where I left off in the paper from the previous video. So first of all, we use passive microwave data because ice and water have very different dielectric emissivities. So they have different properties um, with the incoming um, with the microwave and they so so microwaves are emitted and there's a lot of variation between the open water and sea ice and the microwave radiation uh, penetrates through cloud cover and is independent of sunlight so you can get year-round observation of the cloud cover it's passive so there's no signal being sent from the satellite downwards it's the microwaves that are emitted from the ice and from the open water that move upwards and are detected by the sensors on the satellite. Okay, um, now in the winter, um, the sea ice concentration is determined very well from these, th th these devices. This, there's different algorithms um, to, to look at the data from different satellites, and there's only a small spread of about one to 6%. The sea ice is cold, it's snow covered, very good data. But the emissivity changes quite a bit in the summer because thin ice with, without snow cover, with snow cover, there uh, can be large discrepancies. Melt ponds can lead to sea ice concentration underestimation by as much as 40%. So there's a lot of melt water on, on top of the ice. The satellite can say, ah, this is water. This is, there's no ice there and that would be incorrect. Okay. Um, Okay, so the error happens more in the summer. Um, and you can see when the, uh, you know, of course you can look at the meteorological data and when the temperature goes above zero degrees Celsius, you know things are gonna start to melt and you can see that that happens within, within a week uh, from the satellite sensors. And, you know, in the, um, when the liquid water uh, starts to freeze in, in the, uh, you know, when temperature drops below zero in the fall. Again, you can detect those and, and, and uh, correlate them to the, 
the satellite data. So the um, now the satellites also use uh, you know thicknesses measuring thickness is harder, right? But laser altimetry measures the height of the ice plus the overlying snow cover. So you bounce the laser onto the ice and the, on part of you know and onto the water next to the ice, and you measure the height of the ice plus the snow above the ocean called the snow freeboard, and then you can calculate the thickness of the ice. Radar altimetry altimetry measures the height of the ice above the ocean surface, so just the ice freeboard, uh, not, not with the, without the snow involved. And then we use these um, combined um, data model uh, uh, products like PO mass to get the estimate to estimate the, the, the thickness of the ice and to get the volume. Uh, first year ice grows up to 1.5 to 2 meters thick over the winter season, so most of the ice across the entire region is first year ice. PO mass is Pan Arctic Ice Ocean Modeling and Assimilation System. Now, um, reanalysis re data gets uh, it's used in numerical weather prediction. Um, basically, you get global uh, an estimate across the globe of atmospheric variables from 1979 onwards using reanalysis data. Okay, so let's have a look at the figures. So this is the this is by each month. This is the each, the year here. This is the anomalies in the monthly sea ice extent from November 1978 through July 2018. Now the colors are how many standard deviations the sea ice extent in a given month was above or below the mean sea ice extent for the reference period 81 to 2010. So this is a, this is a climatological reference uh, period. You know, and it's fairly recent, right? But still, look how much things have changed. Okay, th three standard deviations below. And I mean, the red here is, is all... Um, you know, huge negative anomalies. It looks like there's a breaking point here of about 2004, 2005. So that's when the ice state seems to have tipped into, into a heavy loss, very rapid reduction of ice. Um, these are some of the trends. So this is uh, percent reductions per, per year, although it says per decade in the text. Um, you can see in March, there's less ice growth here and here. And in September, most of the ice loss is occurring all in this region. Um, and each region is broken down in terms of the trends, the linear trends of square kilometers of ice loss per year um, in, the winter in the winter case and also in the summer case. Um, melt trends. Um, Okay, so this is trends in melt onset and freeze up. So melting is occurring much, much earlier. The red is much, much earlier, and the freezing is occurring much, much later. Okay, so the duration of the melt season is much, much longer. This is, uh, this is overall, and this is just for one year, 2016. The other curve is from 1979 through 2017 for, for the overall curves. Okay, um, so the trends are two to three days earlier per decade, um, melting and freezing uh, about seven days uh, per decade uh, later. Um, some areas like the Barents Sea are much, much more significant. So the Barents Sea, it's minus 8.2 days earlier per decade, and it's freezing 14.5 days per decade later. Huge. Now, this is the um, sea ice age, you know, red being five plus years. So one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, and you can see we're losing all of the thicker ice. The thicker ice is all disappearing, being replaced by first year ice. And you can really see it here. This is uh, April uh, in 1984 versus April in, in 2018. Okay, almost no, re almost no five-year ice, four-year ice, three-year ice, et cetera. It's all disappeared. The ice is only first year and therefore, you know, 1.5 to two meters thick. And this is, a, this is one of the most striking changes in the sea ice cover in the system. So the ice, this is the ice thickness over time in April, 
um, through the record. So, you know, well over three meters thickness on average. And now we're down to um, approaching just above two meters average thickness. Again, most of the ice is first year ice, which grows from 1.5 to two meters. So this will continue to go down until, you know, it's, uh, this is, this is going to continue to go down. Okay, now because there's less and less ice, we're getting these um, rapid ice growth events and rapid ice loss events. So the, um, the rapid ice loss events are in the very, very warm summers, of course, but because there's much less ice, you know, when it starts to freeze, it's open ocean, the ice can grow very, very quickly in the fall. Okay, and uh, so let's have a look uh, at this plot here. So this shows you, these are the rapid ice growth events. So these are in the fall and uh, it's a seven day long period. Uh, the blue areas you grow 800,000 square kilometers within the week and the red area is more than a million square kilometers within the week and you can see these growth areas I mean there's some here but they're becoming more and more common here because as there's more and more sea ice lost there's more open water in the Arctic so the sea the, the ice can grow very quickly and also uh, it's happening later in the fall so there may have been a lot of snow already just on the open water. It doesn't go onto the ice. So the ice is not snow covered as much. So it grows much more fast. And also thin ice, uh, you know, grows much quicker than thicker ice because the insulation is much lower, the thermal insulation. Ice is a good insulator. So thinner, thinner, the thinner the ice, the less insulation you have, the thicker it will grow. The more, the more cold air from the atmosphere can be transferred through the ice uh, to freeze the water at the bottom of the ice. And these are, um, these are rapid um, ice loss events in summers and they're happening more and more frequently, uh, especially since the tipping of about 2004, 2005 that I showed you in a, in a previous graph. Okay, now the drivers, of course, uh, there's you know, the, there's a, the change in external forcing from anthropogenic sources is the largest by far. Um, the second driving thing could be changes in external forcing from natural drivers, very little effect in the last, uh, you know, number of decades on the ice. And third, the internal variability of the climate system, which I talked about in the previous uh, video. So this is, this is one of the key figures here. So this shows you this is the Arctic sea ice area on the y-axis and the total anthropogenic CO2 emissions in gigatons on the x-axis for each month. And this is from 1953 until 2017. So, so 1953 to 1979 was even pre-satellite data, um, but we had other means of, of getting it. Um, so it's incorporated here. Um, so here we go. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, and look at the number here. So the slope, most of these curves are linear as you see. So as you increase cumulative emissions since 1850 in gigatons, you get a drop, okay? Uh, you get a linear relationship, fairly good R squared fitting coefficient, and the slope is the highest in August. Okay, and uh, 3.2, so 3.2 meters squared of ice is lost per ton of CO2 emitted. And that drops off in July and September, and then it drops off in June and October and so on. So when there's no sea ice in September for the first year, August will be the next to drop, and then October, and then July, and June, and then May and November, right? You can kind of see the order in which the ice disappears from the different months. Okay, um, and let's keep going and have a look at some other figures here. So this is some meteorological data on sea pressures, which indicates the winds, and this is the freezing day anomaly. So we're getting less and less uh, freezing in the high Arctic. Okay, so anyway, thank you for listening and uh, stay safe. Bye for now.